from the first time Edward Longshanks English army invaded Scotland in 1296 and sacked the town of Berwick upon Tweed, brutally slaying thousands of the Scottish inhabitants. The Scottish borders then became a battlefield, a real war zone for almost 300 years, to and fro between the English and Scots armies completely and utterly devastated the place. The men of the borders took up the only way of life they could to survive. They became the border reavers. But what happened to the border reavers? How did they suddenly cease to exist? And that's what I'm going to find out today. And I'll also tell you a bit of the true story about who the Border Reavers really were. Smailham Tower in the central borders, the kind of quintessential border reaver peel tower. These things were all over the borders in the 14-1500s. But after the Union of the Crowns in 1603, sadly Smailham is one of few remaining examples. As you see, in 1603, Queen Elizabeth I of England died. There was no heir to the throne in England. Elizabeth's closest blood relative was King James VI of Scotland, the, the current monarch of Scotland. On the 5th of April 1603, James left Edinburgh for London amid much celebration and fanfare. This was the first time the crowns of Scotland and England were to be unified. But there was one overriding problem which James had to deal with, and that was the lawless border country. A land of bandits, outlaws and ruffians, which separated the two countries at the moment. James's first priority as king of both lands was to quell and pacify the borders, to bring down towers like these and destroy the families that lived in them. James got to work straight away, scripting laws which prohibited the border families from owning any type of weaponry or armour or even horses. He was a road in their way of life. He was making them less powerful. But there was a lot worse to come. And there was areas which were a lot worse off and a lot more targeted than around Smailham here. Areas like Teviotdale, Annandale, close to the border. But particularly in Liddesdale. During the 1500s, Liddesdale here was one of the most heavily populated areas in the entire borderlands. But it was populated by wild men. Armstrongs, Elliots, Grahams, Nixons, Croziers, reaving families with no real allegiance to any kings or queens. Their only honour stood with their family members. They had been a thorn in the side of English and Scottish queens and kings for centuries, but also they'd been useful. They'd been powerful men during war times that the kings and queens had used to their advantage. And they abided no laws but their own. So 
So James the sixth and first of England had to do something about Liddesdale and it wasn't going to be easy. Not only did the king want to destroy the borders physically, he wanted to destroy them psychologically too. He made it law that the borderlands were no longer to be referred to as the borders. They were now to be the middle shires of Great Britain. In the end, when James's plan was finally hatched to quell Liddesdale and the wider borders, it was very simple, very simple. Brutally violent, cruel, some might even say evil, but very simple. Anyone known as a reaver, suspected of being a reaver, or even anyone with a reading surname was to be persecuted, deported, or worst, hanged, burned, or killed by any means possible. Also, James wanted things done quickly. There was to be no time wasted with trials or hearings or claims for justice or fairness. Anybody suspected of a crime Anybody related to anybody suspected of a crime was to be summary executed on the spot with no trial. The only word which would describe the actions taken in Liddesdale in 1603 in today's language would be ethnic cleansing. situated in a small village of Rowan Burn. But this statue is dedicated to Lang Sandy Armstrong. Lang because he was so tall, he was over six feet tall. But Sandy was hung in 1603 during the Union of the Crowns. But what's interesting for me is it wasn't only Sandy that was hung. And doubtless that Sandy had been a criminal or a reaver in some respect. But eleven, eleven of Sandy's sons were hung with him. If that's not ethnic cleansing, what is? The site I'm at here just now in Liddesdale is the Milne Home Cross, an ancient Armstrong graveyard. They just can't help thinking that if it hadn't been for the events of the Union of the Crowns in 1603, that this, this site would have been far greater and far more to it than there is today than the single cross. There are plenty of poems and songs and writings about the Armstrong family in Liddersdale, but to find actual relics on the ground is very difficult. After 1603, most things were destroyed purposefully. But somewhere along the old Waverley line, the, the railway line here, are the remains of the real stronghold of the Armstrongs in Liddersdale and that was Mangerton Tower. So let's go and take a look, see if we can't find it here. This must be the remains of Mangerton here. The term ruin has never been so apt. Sad, really, that this once so majestic, powerful, revered place has been reduced to a pile of rubble and intentionally by the King of Scotland and England. Now, there are still clues here to the, the importance of this place. 
the quality of the masonry, the thickness of the walls, the position it commands right low down here on the river. It was definitely a real, real important place in the day. So that's the buildings, the structures, they were destroyed, as you can see. But what happened to the people, the Armstrongs themselves? Well, they probably suffered a worse fate. A huge percentage of the Armstrong men were killed. With no trial, mass hangings took place all over the area. The exact numbers are very vague because the process was very vague. There was no laws governing it. The king had just simply laid down the criteria that anybody related to, or suspected of being related to, or suspected of being any crime was to be hung on the spot. So the killings were en masse. They were everywhere. Lots and lots, a huge percentage of the Armstrong men were killed. The term Jeddah justice, Jeddah as in Jeddah, is bound about as an almost comedic term, meaning people being hung without trial. But it's no laughing matter, because the term originates from 1603 when King James's court were inflicting general justice on the people of the borders in huge numbers. Of the survivors, they weren't so lucky either, because families Hundreds of families, the Armstrongs, not just Armstrongs, Elliots, Grahams, Nixons and Croziers were deported. Involuntary, forced deportation to Ulster in the north of Ireland. To a boggy place called Ross Common where they were supposed to start a new life, build a new colony for the King in Northern Ireland. Very few of the families stayed in Ireland for longer than a generation. In fact, most of them moved to America. The community in Northern America now, of Scots-Irish, are really all descendants from the borderers who were first deported to Ulster after 1603. And they flourished over there. Two presidents, Nixon and Lyndon B. Johnston, were both defendants of the Scots border reavers. And then we need to look at the Armstrongs in America, a huge clan in America now. And probably the most famous of all the Armstrongs would be the, the first man on the moon. A pioneer above all pioneers. A man who not only rode the moonlight like his ancestors, but flew up and landed on it. Now if you watch this film till the very end, you'll realise why if I was an Armstrong, I would be extremely insulted, annoyed, and angered by this thing here. Because it says, that this tower has been placed into the care of the Armstrong clan by His Grace, the Duke of Buccleuch. His Grace. His Grace. It didn't take long for the King's plan to bear fruit. Pretty soon, all the Liddesdale and the borders it was quiet and peaceful farming land. But in every story of conflicts and change and war, there are losers, but there are also winners. And James could never have completed this plan in the borders without allies within. And in the borders he found two allies, two great allies, that joined his side. Never in history has the phrase poacher turned the gamekeeper been more apt than what it was for these two men. The first of those men was Sir Robert Kerr of Sessford, who was based here at this looming gigantic fortress of Sessford Castle near the English border. In 1603, Sir Robert Kerr was head of the Kerr family. He was one of the most notorious wanted ruffians, reavers on the borderline. 
wanted for many crimes of murder and theft. And he was head of a huge family of cares based here. Let's go and see if we can get in the castle. It's an impressive sight. The walls are up to four metres thick in places. I can't believe it's just been left to, to rot. You can still see the ornamental. I don't know what that was, maybe a fireplace or something up there. Sir Robert Kerr's life as a reaver, however, was about to come to an end. Because Kerr had foreseen the future. He knew that power was shifting to London. He knew the king was about to make changes. So Kerr sided with the king. He sat at the king's knee and begged for scraps. He became a gentleman of the bedchamber for King James. He went to London with King James on that initial journey in 1603. It worked because Kerr fell in favour with the king. His crimes of the past were forgotten and Kerr was elevated to a man of high standing by the king. Some people might say Kerr was successful ahead of his time, forward thinking. Others may say he was a brown noser, a sycophant, a man out for himself who forgot about his people in the borderlands. But whatever your opinion, he was successful. He was spared the misery and violence and death of the other border families. And his quest for land and power snowballed. And he became extremely rich and extremely powerful. The family moved from here at Sessford to Holly Dean near Melrose. The best evidence you will find of the Kerr family at Holly Dean near Melrose is if you come here to Bowden Kirk, just close by. A small, unassuming, but ancient church. Let's go and have a look. But there was no normal gravestones for the Kerr family. There's a special vault or a crypt dedicated to them underneath the churchyard. This is the crypt here. You can see the Kerr coat of arms above the door. 1661, the date there. What can we see inside? It's quite dark, but there's like a wee flap on the door here. I should be able to my torch in there. And you can see the heavily decorated graves, the grand titles, the, the cares or cars or whatever derivation of their name they were using at the time placed upon themselves. The modest bowed in Kirk, the exclusive crypt for the Kerr family here, were nothing compared to what he was about to come into. The ultimate accolade, however, was bestowed upon Kerr in 1616 by the king. He was made Lord Kerr of Sesford. And he was also created as the first ever Earl of Roxburgh. The former murderous border reaver now sat in high office at Floors Castle. And the rest, as they say, 
it's history or written history that everybody knows about. But Kerr was not the only border reaver, however, to side with the king and make great personal gains. The other story from the other side of the country is even more treacherous in my opinion. Walter Scott of Buccleuch had gained fame and notoriety in the borders mainly because of the part he played in the rescue of King Willie from Carlisle Castle a mere few years before the Union of the Crowns in 1603. He was a man who was wanted for many murders. He was a man who'd led, led many raids into England. But at the Union of the Crowns, he knew what was happening. He seen what had been lauded upon care of Sessford and he wanted some of that too. To avoid arrest and summary execution in 1603, Buccleuch offered to go and fight for the king in Spain and took a band of his men with him. Such was the warrior Buccleuch was, he went there and done a great job and was back in the borders in 1606. But it was when he came back in 1606 that he became an agent of the king in Liddesdale and these areas. Rounding up the Armstrongs, Elliots, Grahams and any other reaving families. And he was the man executing them now. Men who he'd rode with, fought with, before the Union of the Crowns, he was now killing en masse. And not only that, but Buccleuch was taking the land of the people who were being killed. He suddenly and very quickly amassed a fortune in land. And this here Bowhill is only one of his vast residences. Who pretty much monopolised land owning in the western side of the border since 1603. Anything that was fair game, he took it by any means, usually by death of the current owners. He was immune from the king. Anybody but Border Reaver's surname was to die with no trial. And Clue carried out that order to great effect. Not bad for a man who had his head on the chopping block himself a few years earlier. In the end, the pacification of the borders had been swift. By 1616, there were no border reavers. It was brutal and violent and cruel, but nothing if not efficient and effective from King James's viewpoint anyway. The powerful families of yesteryear, the Armstrongs, the Elliots, the Grahams, the Nixons, the Croziers, were either dead, deported, or depleted to a level which made them nothing. The Kerrs and the Scots, however, rounded up every single bit of land and became extremely rich and extremely powerful and are to this day. Good or bad, you decide.